on uh, crypto Twitter. But because uh, everyone is waiting for this moment when, when the Bitcoin tweet would finally come. So what's your take on uh, what was your initial reaction when you saw it? Well, hell may have broken loose on Twitter, but it certainly didn't in the press which, as you mentioned, really just shrugged it off. I think, as you say, a lot of people have been waiting for this moment to come. It's felt inevitable for a long time that at some point cryptocurrency would be dragged into the spotlight with regulators, with policymakers, with politicians. And it seems to me like Libra has really just accelerated that. And so here we are. Uh, talk to me a little bit, because you were sitting here a few weeks ago. We were talking about all the excitement around Facebook's Libra, their new cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, though, this week, as we've had more scrutiny, scrutiny over it, scrutiny. How do I say that? Scrutiny. scrutiny. It's Friday. <laughs> it's a Friday. You know, f more of that from President Trump and even Jay Powell this week. Does that hurt the efforts within the crypto world or does it bring it more legitimacy as people mm -hmm. are finally at least continuing to talk about it? Well, you know, I really think that Libra and Bitcoin are apples to oranges, and we talked about this a couple weeks ago. Um, because it is President Trump, I, I feel I'd be remiss if I didn't read another quote of his from eight years ago. Uh oh. The Fed's reckless policies of low interest and flooding the market with dollars needs to be stopped or we will face record inflation. And in some respects, he's been right because Bitcoin's up 240,000% versus the dollar in that time. So um, certainly, uh, I think Chairman Powell had it right. Bitcoin is not going to be a useful currency for the mainstream for the foreseeable future. But what he also said is it could compete as a store of value, a type of substitute for gold and a gold 2.0, particularly for a, long, uh, a younger investor base. So I think um, if you take that framing for Bitcoin and you look at Libra instead as a bona fide threat to the U.S. dollar because they are thinking about structuring this, uh, with a basket of international currencies and really decoupling the Fed's influence over that currency that they've envisioned, uh, it seems like Libra should continue to draw most of the attention and ire, um, both because it's on the wrong side of the political cycle. It, it just announced the $5 billion settlement with right. the FTC today. Um, and also just because it is a stable store of value that could truly be an alternative to the mass market overnight. So, so Jill, uh, Ryan makes a good point just about this idea of uh, Libra potentially being a threat to the dollar, depending on how you look at it, or at least that might be the concern. We did actually hear, though, from the co-founder uh, of Ethereum, where, he actually, where, where they actually talked about this idea that uh, Libra in and of itself could sort of threaten the blockchain, or at least, I guess, steal some oxygen out of sort of the fundamental nature of what made uh, the blockchain and sort of the original cryptocurrencies uh, so attractive. Do you think that's a concern here? I, you know, I think that we do a disservice to the whole space by conflating cryptocurrencies, digital currencies like Libra that are maybe less decentralized, that use slightly different technologies. We tend to lump them together as just a single asset class. But I would actually argue that Bitcoin in many ways has more in common with gold than it does with Libra. And if we think about legacy financial assets, we don't lump them together based on the technologies that we use to settle and clear them. Mm. We lump them together based on very different characteristics. And I think that even in Trump's tweets, actually, he starts to get at this. You know, he differentiates between Libra, which is issued by a, a, a centralized entity, versus cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin that have very different characteristics. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting, Ryan, who's very specific. He's like, you know, Facebook wants to get into money. Let them start a ba get a banking license like anyone else who wants to get into payments. But if they don't want to do that, it's so intuitively get that essentially Libra is just kind of a form of regulatory arbitrage or way to make a payment system without actually doing the work of what you're supposed to do to provide payments? Well, I wouldn't even pretend to try to get into the president's head uh, on, on a number of matters, but uh, I do think that he has uh, a good slate of advisors that are studying this very closely. And, and we do know that some of his former and current advisors do know a thing or two about cryptocurrency. Steve Bannon has been very outspoken as a proponent of Bitcoin. Um, uh, Representative Mulvaney uh, was part of the uh, Congressional Caucus on Blockchain Technology, is now the Chief of Staff. So there are informed people that can maybe make some of these distinctions between a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, some of the privacy currencies that might actually present more regulatory challenges, and something like a centralized, uh, at least 
currently centralized payment technology like Libra. Jill, I want to ask you about the, uh, the political valence of cryptocurrency because ostensibly, uh, you know, Bitcoin or anything else does not inherently have a political ideology, but it does feel like a lot of the critics of President Trump, like a certain sort of like right wing strain to it. And you heard Ryan mention that uh, Steve Bannon talks about cryptocurrencies sometimes. Is that part of why there was sort of this heartbreak because people thought that maybe Trump with his ideology was kind of a fellow traveler to a lot of Bitcoiners? So I, I think that some certainly probably thought that, but I think for the most part, part of the beauty to me of Bitcoin and this whole cryptocurrency space is just the complete diversity of people that it tends to appeal to. It appeals to certainly the sort of very right wing crowd, libertarian crowd, uh, anyone who is kind of anti big government, anti authoritarianism. Um, but then you also see, you know, that what I've studied very deeply is folks in other countries and places like Venezuela actually using this stuff. And so there's, it's hard to really put in one bucket the types of people who are interested in this space. And so I wouldn't say that there's necessarily been a sense of disappointment around President Trump's statements. And I think, again, that's been reflected in the price, just shrugging it off. So. Ryan, we heard from Jill about the types of people, of course, they get excited or would be interested in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about the types of businesses that can really use the blockchain technology. We spoke with the CEO of Diginex, uh, I think it was just actually a few days ago. And, mm -hmm. you know, are, is it a supply chain like a GE where you can really understand who is buying the products? Is it a homeowner if you need a title company done in a secure way? What types of companies do you really see embracing this technology? That's a really open-ended question. I mean, depending on who you ask you in the industry, this is, this, is, this, is a, this is a cure-all for every sector of the economy. Um, basically, anywhere where you need an interoperable standard to record ownership. Um, and, and so title insurance is one thing. Currencies and payments are another. I, I do think, though, it's important to distinguish. You talked about supply chain, some of the corporate applications of blockchain technology. And, um, and some of these permission systems that might be corporate run or via a consortium and truly decentralized systems like Bitcoin or Ethereum. And, and I think that's the point about the conflation of, of the two. Um, there are pretty significant differences for who would use something like Bitcoin, where predominantly it's going to be a hedge against volatility and a long-term speculative store of value if you're into gold and, and similar uh, hedges against inflation. On the other hand, some of the blockchain applications that have no currency associated um, and will not necessarily need a currency to, to actually secure those networks um, will work just fine in a corporate setting. Mm -hmm. Joe, real quickly before we go, I want to pose to you the question that I asked Ryan earlier about Libra and uh, Trump saying, you know, get a banking license if you want to be a bank. In your view, is Libra in large part attempt to do an end run about a run around existing payments regulations? I don't think so, actually. And I think that that team at Facebook and now at Libra is being very intelligent about how they're rolling this out. I can tell you with some degree of certainty that it's no surprise to that team that regulators are coming back and saying, we need to talk, put this on pause. They've rolled this out early. They've put out the announcement long before they intend to go live with any actual product. And that team, they have experience building PayPal, building other technology, financial institutions. They're going to be smart about this. It's no surprise to them. I don't think that they're just doing the regulatory arbitrage play.